Go ahead and be finding in your Bibles with me tonight. We're going to go to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1. And uh, we're going to read the first four verses of that. Been studying, and uh, I told everybody, I let everybody in on a secret the other night, and I was teasing Brother Gene. I said, I don't have a clue how to preach. And to give you an update, uh, nothing has changed since Sunday, but uh, I'm still trusting the Lord that he'll take care of it for me. So uh, Ezra chapter 1, and we're going to read those first four verses, and it says this. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of, of his place help him with silver, and with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, beside the freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. You may be seated tonight. I've titled the message, What's All That Noise? What's All That Noise? Now, we'll get more to that later, uh, but I want to, uh, just uh, by way of introduction, uh, look at a few things. Uh, here we have the uh, Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Judah, destroyed Solomon's temple, and the Jews had been in Babylonian captivity, uh, which would total 70 years. The land was desolate, according to the word of Jeremiah, years before. And uh, that's found over in the 25th chapter of Jeremiah. And uh, here we have God stirs the heart of the new king, Cyrus. And Cyrus makes his proclamation that God hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And uh, Cyrus also declares that the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had brought out of the temple should be brought out of the treasury to be returned to Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting to note, and we'll get into the message uh, here in just a few minutes, but I have to come by a few things by way of introduction here before we get there. Um, it's interesting to note, as I was studying about this, is Isaiah actually had prophesied uh, what Cyrus was doing some uh, 140 to 200 years before this happened. Pretty amazing, the Word of God and how he used that. Um, actually, the verse is found in Isaiah 44, verse uh, 28, and it says this, That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now that's pretty amazing God right there that you have anywhere, depending on when it was written, uh, 140 to 200 years before this happens, this thing that's about to happen, you have Cyrus was named even before he was born. Isn't that amazing? Isn't, if, if, if that doesn't tell you that the Word of God is inspired, I, don't, I mean, you're ignorant to the Word of God or you're just not wanting to know it because that's pretty amazing. I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, but here God told Isaiah uh, what was going to happen hundreds of years later. Now, uh, if those of you that like to study that sort of thing, you can go to the 44th chapter of Isaiah, and you can read about that in the 44th and 45th chapter, if you're interested in know more about that. But anyway, moving on to this, we're talking about how God is beginning to stir up this congregation of people. He's got a new king, and he stirs up his heart to build his house. Jerusalem is desolate because they refuse to, uh, to uh, uh, obey God and, and do what he was commanding them to do, and they were, they were brought into Babylonian captivity, their temple destroyed, and uh, here they are, and now God is beginning to do a work in the lives of these people. He's beginning to stir up the king. It's amazing. 
amazing how, as we read in that, that he says, uh, the Lord has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And not only that, but he says, all the things that Nebuchadnezzar took out of the old uh, temple, you're going to get them out of the treasury, and I'm going to take them back, and I'm going to put them in the new temple that you guys are going to build over there in Jerusalem. It's amazing how God can move upon whomever he will, whenever he will, to accomplish his purpose. There's a verse in Proverbs 21.1 that says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. And that's an amazing thing. That's what God is doing here in this verse. Now, uh, let's go on to uh, uh, verse number five in this first chapter and look at what it says. It says, then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. So notice that God began stirring the heart of the king stirring him up saying that uh, he's going to fund it everything's going to be provided and now you have the people are beginning God is stirring the people up to go up and to build the house. They're going to return and build the house of the Lord. Now uh, in the second chapter of this book it's a bunch of names and it tells you a whole bunch of people that went there and uh, it's estimated somewhere around 50,000 maybe 60,000 but I just want to to point out by way of introduction that God is beginning to work in these people wouldn't you agree that God is beginning to do a work in these people and not only them but also in the king and he's beginning to bring about the things that he said he would do and uh, it's amazing to watch God begin to do the things that he says he will do amen so going on over to the, uh, the third chapter, I'll let you turn over to there. Uh, we're going to look, and this will be the main one that we will focus on, is in the third chapter. And uh, like I said, stay with me. We're going to get into the bulk of the message here in just a few minutes. This is just kind of getting us ready for it. Uh, but the third chapter, let's look at the first three verses of that. It says, uh, and when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brother and the priests, and uh, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God, uh, uh, the altar of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon its bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. Now, number one about this, as this uh, God is stirring up the king, stirring up the people, notice the first thing that they do when they come in, the very first thing that happens is they build the altar. They build the altar. This is, uh, this is so important that the very first thing that they come in and do, they initiate the sacrifice, they begin to build the altar. And I want you to notice something else about this is notice in the second verse, uh, it says that uh, it, they were doing this as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So this is, a, this is also a revival of the word of God. So how do they come about what they're needing to do? They, uh, they look to the word of God. How do they come about the, the processes and the things that they're going to do? Remember, they've been in captivity. They've been in basically in prison all these years, and now suddenly God is stirring up the king. He stirs him up. He brings him back in. He's providing every Everything that they need for this process and he brings them into this place and so what do they do they look to the Word of God as it is written there was no debating about it they didn't have to have a committee and a subcommittee to talk about what that committee had done they just looked to the Word of God they simply looked to see what God was saying amen so we have here a revival of the Word of God now I want you to notice this also this is important there was a remembrance of the men of God notice that they mentioned Moses the man of God there was not only they looked to the Word of God but there was a remembrance of men of God in the past now how how amazing is that you take these people that maybe don't know what to, what to do and so they say well Let's look to the Word of God. So they look to the Word of God and they say, well, how do we go about this? Well, Moses did it this way. Moses was in communion with God. Moses wrote it down this way. So that's probably a good example to follow. Amen? 
they're saying, well, maybe we need to look to somebody that has a little bit more knowledge. And Moses spent a lot of time with God, so let's look and see how he did it. And as I was looking at that, I was reminded of, of a few things. How many were here when, uh, when Gunner was up here? And uh, he stood beside his papa, and papa raised his hand up. And Gunner, there's a picture of it on Facebook where he's got his hand raised up just like papa. Just like him. You know what that is? Papa is the man of God to him. He looks up to him. When he gets older and he starts looking into the word of God, he's going to say, now, I remember how Papa did this. The man of God, I remember what he preached. The word of God says this, and I looked at his life, and I see how he did it, and he begins to set a course for the children. You follow me here? They begin to set a course. Now, think about that. That, that, that uh, that's something and, and we learn from, from those that are before us and they learn those from, that are before them and, and uh, you go all the way back to the line, the apostles, and they learned it from Jesus. And Jesus is God. Think about that. You're passing something along, along the way. I thought also in my own life how I watched dad as I was growing up to know, you know, when it came time to pray, I remember dad would get up his Bible and he'd open it up and he'd pray and we would have a message. And I remembered words that he would say, how he would pray. And I remember when I got down to pray, I said, well, I wonder how dad did it. Well, I'll do it the way he did it. He knows what he's doing, setting a good example. And so I learned to pray by that way. And also by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, what it shows, but also by example of good godly men and women in the house of God. Those are important things that you're putting into people. You, there are people watching you you may not realize are watching you. Amen? Not only did they look to Moses, but down in the 10th verse, you'll find that they went after the ordinances of David, king of Israel. So you have there looking to Moses. How did Moses do it? How did David do it? Well, we probably, uh, it would be all right to try to follow their examples because they're godly man. David, a man after God's own heart, right? Think about it. You're, you're setting up uh, an example for your children, for your grandchildren. And when they grow up in this dark world, when these little ones are growing up in the dark world and they're trying to figure out how to go about it and they're looking to the word of God, they're also going to look to the men and women of God. How did it go? How did, I, how did they do it? How did they get by? When I stand behind this pulpit, I say, well, how did dad do it? He set an example. We all are setting examples for people. We all are setting examples for people. But I want you to notice that the altar is built. The sacrifice is commenced. They didn't have anything yet there. That they started this, uh, the altar, the sacrifice. They looked to the word of God. What does the word of God say about it? They looked to the examples of those that were before them. Now let's take a look at the verses uh, 4 through 9. It says, they kept also the feast of the tabernacle, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And afterwards, uh, offered the continual burnt offerings, both of the new moons, and of all the feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. For from the first day of the seventh month begin they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. See, they didn't have anything yet here. They were simply going off. The, they built the altar, got that started, went and looked to the word of God, the men of God of the past, how to go about it. Verse 7 will continue. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre, and to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus king of Persia now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month began Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josedek and the remnant of their brethren the priests and the Levites and all they that were come out of the captivity under Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 21 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord and verse 9 then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren Cadmiel and his sons and the sons of Judah together to set forward the workmen and the house of God, the son of Hinnadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. You say, now why did you read all that? 
I want you to realize that these people, did you see the great lengths that they were going through? Did you see that they didn't leave, they weren't leaving anything out? They went step by step by step by step. They began to initiate to do each one of these things. They began to get into it. They began to do what they, what they knew to do according to the word of God because there was a revival of the word of God. They've been stuck in captivity. Remember, they've been stuck in captivity all this time. Now they come out. There's a revival of the word of God. The altar is built. There's the examples of the men of God. Now uh, they're getting things in order. They're getting things things in order they're getting it all set in order they look to the word of God and all these examples they have a blueprint and the spirit of God is stirring them up remember the spirit of God was stirring these people up and they begin to work in those verses now here's where we get into the message I know I don't want to bore you guys I'm glad you stuck with me now we're into the message here we're here you say well that sounded like a, a lot of the message no this is the message look at verse number 10 the foundation is laid. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, uh, the sons of Asaph, with the cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of King uh, David, king of Israel. Now listen, this is something exciting to them. This is something that only God could do. Remember where they come out of. This is something that only God could do. One day they're in Babylon and the next day they're here and they're back in their homeland and God has given them all the things that they need to begin to build this temple in their land. They've come up out of captivity. God is stirring up the heart of the king. He's stirring up their heart. People are coming out and the foundation is laid. They came from a place of desolation. They came from a place where they had nothing. This was a reason to pray. Praise God. This was a reason to praise God. And as I was reading this, I remembered uh, this church whenever the foundation was laid here. Remember, I remembered uh, when the property was bought and we come out and we looked at, I looked at the field and I just seen a big field out here. And then uh, we come out and we dedicated that field and then it wasn't too long later that we began to move dirt around out here. And uh, there was, you know, the roads were cut coming up to this place where we're sitting tonight. And, uh, and then uh, there a little while longer and then the footing was, was laid. And then I remember when they come out and the, and the foundation was being poured out here. And you had them guys with the, with the concrete sticks, them big old long poles, them floats. And they're whoo, sliding them across, making it slick. I mean, they were working it over. And, uh, and after that, I remember thinking, you know, you, you see stuff coming up out of it all over the you know, pipes and stuff and, and uh, where plumbing and different things are going to go and you start looking around. And, and let me tell you, it was something that was exciting. It was something that was exciting because now we have a foundation. There's something that we can build on out here. There's something that's happening. It's starting to take shape. There's something that walls are going to go up and, and uh, you know, there's the wires are going to be ran and everything's going to begin to come together in this place. We'd seen it on paper and we'd seen the property, but now all of a sudden the foundation is laid. And I remember just going out here and looking around and seeing all the things, trying to, trying to sort out, okay, this is going to be here and that's going to be there. And, and, uh, but I, it, didn't make all, it didn't really make all that much sense yet, but there was an excitement about it. We'd outgrown our little storefront building. We, we needed a bigger place. And there was an excitement. I was just a little kid when this was happening, but I remember it. I remember it. And the foundation is laid here. And I believe that this was something that was absolutely thrilling to these people. I believe it was something that, that they had to look at even just that foundation and say, wow, it's something only God can do. Wow, this is something only God can do. And they remembered where they just came from and now hear where they are. Here they are. Now listen, there were reasons for shouts and praise. So they did. There was reason for shouts and praise, and so they did. Look at verses 10 and 11. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. 
You know what that means? It means they got dressed up. They put on their, they put on their garments. They put on their apparel. They got dressed up. They got excited. You know what they did? They got out their trumpet. Right? They got out their trumpets. They got out their cymbals. They're going to crash them together. Why? Because the foundation was laid, and it was something that only God could do. Something that only God could do. The foundation was laid, and there was a reason to shout, and there was a reason to praise. And so what did they do? They go over there to Psalms uh, chapter 136, and they say, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endureth forever. And I believe they played those trumpets, and they crashed those cymbals, and they had a good time, and I bet they clapped their hands, and they shouted to the Lord, because this was something that only God could do. Only God could do it. And so they shouted and they sang, giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. This was a burst of light in their dark history. They've been in captivity all this time, and now look what God is doing. Something is happening. God's stirring them up. They were beginning to have everything restored to them. Having everything restored back to him. You know, it says in Zechariah 4, uh, 6, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's what's happening here. Not by their abilities, not by their power, not by anything that they could do themselves, but by the spirit of the Lord. Was stirring them up, stirring the king, stirring their hearts. But listen to this. Many men wept. Many of them wept. Let's look at verse number 12. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice. They wept. Now why was that? These guys had seen that first temple. My, what a temple it was. Solomon's temple. All the gold and the brass and the silver, all the things that he had there. My, what an amazing temple it was. And they seen the foundation of the new one laid. And they're saying, how could this one compare? How could this one compare to the glory of the former temple? How could it? You young guys, you never seen how incredible that, that Solomon's temple was. You didn't see how, how wonderful it was. Lord, boy, let me tell you. And they wept. How can it compare? But listen, there were many that shouted aloud for joy. There were others that were shouting for joy. Why? Because the Lord is good. Because His mercy endures forever. Because they just come out of captivity. That's all they knew. And here they were, and this was a, a monumentous occasion. The foundation is laid. The foundation is laid. We've heard about it. We've heard about what you had, but look, the foundation is laid. Maybe we get to have some times like you guys talk about. And many of them shouted aloud for joy. All they knew was captivity. Now they see that God is doing something that only he could do. By his spirit, by his power, he's performing a work according to the word of the Lord. Exactly as it was written in the word of God, God stirred the heart of the king and here they are. And they were praising God. They went from captivity to construction. And that was exciting to them. So it brings me to verse 13. Why all the noise? Why all the noise? Let's read that 13th verse. <laughs> some wept and some shouted for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. So people were hearing this and they heard some people crying over here. 
And they heard some people shouting over here and it all jumbled together and it was a bunch of noise. Some were shouting, some were crying. You know, sometimes in a time where it should be joyful, there are those, there are some that because of the glory of the past, they fail to see the glory of the present. Think about it. Even in our own lives, sometimes we can say, God, I don't feel like you're doing what you used to do in me. And sometimes you can, you can look to the past and you can live in the past and not realize the good things that God's doing in your life right this minute. There are some people that will weep and they'll cry even though God is laying a foundation and stirring the heart of the king and stirring them up. Even though God is doing a work in your heart, they'll look back and they'll say, boy, I don't know how you could ever top that, Lord. Right? Right? How many has ever been there? You don't have to confess it if you don't want to, but I'm just saying. There are times where sometimes we can let the past be all that we look at. But there are those who shouted. There are those who wept. There are people that are living in movements of the past. Movements of the past. And they think that maybe because God isn't moving in the same way that they seen back then, then maybe he's not moving now. I'm here to tell you that God is still moving. I'm here to tell you that God is still moving. He never quit. Don't weep over the past. Shout for joy at what God is doing. You realize now we're closer to Jesus' return than we've ever been. Great revivals of the past. Yes, hundreds were saved. But you shout for joy when that one comes to the altar here in the day that we live now. Because all of heaven's shouting over him. Don't you weep over that man when there's just one. His eternal soul has been saved. Give glory to God for the one. Don't despise the small things. God is still moving. Because even if it's just one, remember that God brings the increase. God brings the increase. So don't say what God's doing is lacking. No, God's still moving today. Now, it brings me, as I come to the conclusion of the message, I'm not keeping you very long tonight. The present outlook may look grim. It may look terrible. But the uplook is great. Because Jesus said, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus said to look up. Now, I want to come to the last part. Here's what I want you guys to notice. <laughs> the altar is built. That was what we talked about very first. They looked to the word of God, the example of those before them. The foundation was laid. They shouted and they praised God. There was reason to, so they did. Some were weeping. Some were shouting for joy. There was noise where you heard both. You heard crying and shouting in the same place. And others were hearing that and you couldn't discern between it. But I want to come back to the first point. The altar is built. The Lamb of God has been slain. Jesus Christ has been slain at the cross of Calvary. Look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Before the foundation of the world, foreordained that Jesus Christ would die on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. 
before the foundations of the world. Think about that. The very first thing, the sacrifice is made. The foundation is laid. That is something to build on the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? In Matthew 16, verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The finished work of Jesus Christ is our foundation, and he is the rock on which we will build upon. The rock is Christ Jesus, the truth that Jesus is the son of the living God, and that is what is built upon. The sacrifice is made. The foundation is laid. Now, how could the glory of that temple that they were building there that we were reading about in Ezra, how could it compare to the first temple? Solomon's wonderful and glorious temple. Incredible, amazing. You know how? Because that very temple that they built was the one that Jesus Christ himself walked inside of. Jesus was coming to that temple! Think about it. Now listen. Why all the noise? You and I have a reason to shout. Because you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. You know what's even better? Jesus Christ is coming to pick up you and me and take us back to heaven with him. Jesus Christ is coming to his church, the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's coming to you and me. Come on. He's coming to us. (laughs) We are the temple of the Holy Ghost and Jesus is coming to take us home. What? Know ye not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Stephen said in his sermon, in Acts chapter 7, verse 48, he said, The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He dwells in you and I. Jesus said that that spirit would be in us. He said, you would know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. In the last verse of the the night, John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The altar is built. The foundation is laid, our Lord Jesus Christ. Why all the noise? Well, there shouldn't be any noise. Shouts of victory because Jesus is coming. Shouts of victory because Jesus is coming. Amen? I do hope that you got something out of the message tonight. Just know that no matter what The outlook is, the uplook is great. No matter how grim it may look around you, look and see what God's doing inside of your life now. Look and see what he is going to do inside of your life. And maybe God is building something incredible inside of you. Don't despise what he's doing. Don't weep over the past and what used to be. Because so much greater was coming. 
so much greater was coming. We're closer now than ever. Why would you look around you and let it discourage you? We're so close to the return of Jesus Christ. There shouldn't be anyone weeping other than for the souls that don't know him. Go ahead and bow your heads with me as we have a, a song tonight, an invitation. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, I thank you for this message. And Lord, you know the importance of it. I don't. You know each heart and every person. So Father, I pray that you take this word. Lord, let it sink down deep into our hearts. And God, help us to never despise the things that you're doing now, but to recognize your hand at work, that there are things going on in our lives preparing us for something it's something that only you could do. Something that only you can do. And Lord, we know that, the, that uh, you're coming soon. And we have something to look forward to, Jesus. And I join with John and say, even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come. Father, continue to, to speak to our hearts and burden our hearts to go into the community, community to reach those that don't know you. Lord, if there's one in here tonight that doesn't know you, Father, I pray that you'll speak to their heart and draw them to you. I give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me. We're going to have an invitation. These altars are open for you. If you have any need, you can bring it to the Lord tonight.